A warm good evening to one and all. Welcome to our program Insight, organized by Research Committee and Internal Quality Assurance Cell, St. Joseph's College for Women, Alapura, in collaboration with Society of Biotechnologists India, Association of Food Scientists and Technologists, Skill India, and Institution Innovation Council, aim to transform young minds through science, powering innovative programs from 28 February to March 15, ranging from demonstrations, open labs, webinars, exhibitions, games, popularization, and many more promoting scientific timber and aptitude among young talents. Let's start the session with a silent prayer. Respected principal, Dr. Rita Leta Dikoto, esteemed speaker, Dr. Mohanan Valiyavitil, President, Society of Biotechnologists India, Dr. Idakil Vijayan, Secretary of SBTA, Dr. Anju Tia, President of AFSTA Kollam Chapter, Dr. K.K. Abdul Rashid, Secretary of AFSTA, Dr. Tara CM, IQC Coordinator, Dr. Anju M. Neelera, Executive Members of SBTA, AFSTA Kollam Chapter, Skill India Institution Innovation Council Members, Research Executive Members, Teachers, lab assistants and my dear students. I'm extremely honored to have such a great opportunity to speak before this esteemed gathering about the National Science Day and welcome our esteemed speakers and participants for the event. Today, all of us are gathered here to celebrate the discovery and show our dignity and respect to the great Indian physicist, Sir C. V. Raman for his contribution to the field of science. The theme of National Science Day 2022 is Integrated Approach in Science and Technology for Sustainable Future. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, biosafety allows us to analyze and manage risk regarding the food safety, improving synergies among sectors, improving food safety and streamlining the trade. I wish all the science enthusiasts the very best to enhance their scientific seal. First of all, I welcome our respected principal, Dr. Rita Leda Dikoto, for being the catalyst that stimulated us to do our best and standing as a pillar of strength. With utmost respect on behalf of research committee, IQAC, SBTI, AFSTA, Skill India, IIC, I welcome our esteemed speaker, Dr. Mohanan Valiyavitil, Senior Principal Scientist of Institute of Advanced Virology among our midst. To introduce the speaker, Dr. Mohanan Valiyavitil, Senior Principal Scientist of Institute of Advanced Virology, Tonake License Park, Tiruvanthapuram. The academic qualifications, Dr. Mohanan have been graduated in zoology from Calicut University of Kerala. He has completed his MSc in industrial fisheries from Cochin University of Science and Technology, Kerala, and has uh, qualified the PhD in biotechnology, specialized in molecular neurobiology from QSAT. And he has undergone uh, the training in virology from University of Kansas Medical Center, USC, and Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science, North Chicago, USA. He is having more than 13 years of teaching experience from eminent institutions, namely MES Konani College, Kerala, International Graduate Students Program in Biological Sciences, Chicago Medical School, and MSc Biotechnology, MSc Microbiology from QSAT. He is having incredible research credentials and publications. He has supervised the PhD students from Rosalind Franklin University and also he is supervising the PhD students in QSAT. He has also supervised the postdoctoral fellows and postgraduates from QSAT and Rosalind Franklin University. And he is having publications about 44 with cumulative impact factor. 210, citations 3005, H index of 28, and item index 41. And he is having several presentations in national and international conferences. 
Dr. Mohanan is also serving as journal reviewer in many prestigious journals like Plus Pathogen, BMC, Microbiology, Viruses, Molecular Oncology, and many more. And he is an invited speaker in the regional, national, and international level. And to his credit, he has completed the research projects funded by HM Bly Cancer Research, funding around $25,000. Then DBT project costing around 99.37 lakhs and DST project worth 47 lakhs in the areas of microbiology, immunology, oncogenesis and pathogenesis. And he has grabbed sent several honors and awards like Agricultural Scientist Recruitment Board National Eligibility Test, JRF and SRF from CSIR and his research papers have ranked in top 2% of papers published in biology and medicine during the year 2010 and 2015. And he has also been awarded the Ramalinga Swami Fellowship from DBT, Government of India. And he is uh, having memberships in many eminent uh, associations and organizations, namely Society for Biotechnologists, then American Association of Virologists, Chicago. And he is also serving as the advisory board member in several institutes and also the research advisory board member of DBT star at Newman College and many such universities. With that most respect, uh, I welcome you, sir, to this session. And uh, now, I wholeheartedly welcome with gratitude all the dignitaries of SBTA, AFSTA, Skill India, Institution Innovation Council, uh, especially uh, the President of um, AFSTA, Dr. K.K. Rashid, and the Secretary, Dr. Tara CM, and also Dr. Anju Tia, the Secretary of SBTA, and thank them for their valuable support. I also welcome Dr. Anju M. Nilera, our IPC coordinator, who is a constant source of motivation and encouragement. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very proactive and dedicated staff of our Josephian family. I welcome all the heads of the departments, faculty members, research committee members, lab attendants, and non-teaching staff to make this event fruitful. Last but not the least, I welcome all the students for attending this session. Thank you. Now, I request Dr. Mohanan Valiwitan, a scientist, principal scientist of the Institute of Virology, to deliver this session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bagya, for the warm introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers and the program coordinators for inviting me. Then let us start then. So today I'm going to talk about biosafety measures in a laboratory. So this is just uh, an overview of what I will cover in my talk today. So I'll give some background information about uh, biosafety and then I'll talk about some of the important microorganisms that cause diseases in humans and then the biosafety levels that are used for handling these uh, uh, microorganisms. Then the standard practices that need to be followed in biosafety level laboratories as well as Special practices need to be followed in laboratory uh, with the biosafety level uh, requirements. Then finally, I will talk about the stand. Uh, I'll um, give you a template for preparing standard operating procedure in biosafety level laboratories. So this is what I'm going to talk about, talk today. So let us begin with uh, biosafety. So biosafety is actually... Excuse me, sir. Uh, Sorry yes. for the interruption. Sir, can you slightly increase the volume of your microphone or slightly move closer to the microphone, sir? Okay. How is it now? Uh, is, it, is it audible? It's audible, sir. But uh, we would appreciate if it's a bit more louder. So the, can you slightly increase the volume of the microphone or the system, sir? I think this is the maximum that I can put. Okay, sir. Then it's okay, sir. 
Okay. So slides are not visible, sir. Slides are not visible. No, sir. It, it is visible. Here it's visible. Visible or not? Yeah, ma'am, it's visible here. Okay. Oh, it's visible, right? Yes, sir. It's visible. Uh, can I start? Is it visible to everyone or is it visible to only? Actually, sir, this oh, session is conducted both online and offline. Sir, you can continue. We can hear. I will. Um, okay, uh, I will do one thing. I'll turn off my video, and then I'll turn it on at the end of my talk. Okay. Is that okay? Would that be okay? Hello. Hello, sir. Now Hello. we can see the slides also, sir. It's okay. Whichever way you please, it's okay with us, sir. Uh, okay. Oh. Uh, okay. 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 Then let us start then. Now uh, we know that there are many infectious agents that affect humans. Uh, these infectious agents include viruses, bacteria, fungi. And there are um, other hazardous materials also, or other hazardous um, infectious um, agents. So these include the human cells, tissues, and body fluids uh, uh, from uh, patients who are infected with uh, various kinds of organisms. And the researcher uh, uh, gets uh, this infection through various routes, that is, the um, uh, uh, through inhalation of aerosols or through inoculation by sharps in injection. These are the various routes of exposure um, uh, in biosafety laboratories. So to reduce the uh, exposure to microorganisms, uh, we use biosafety level laboratories. These biosafety level laboratories reduce the exposure to an infectious agent as well as contamination of the environment and ultimately spread to the community. So this is the basic principle of biosafety level laboratories. So if we uh, look at, so I said that there are uh, different kinds of microorganisms that affect uh, humans. These microorganisms are divided into different risk groups based on uh, its risk to public growth. There are four major uh, risk groups. These are risk group one or RG1. This is the lowest risk group. And risk group two or RG2 is moderate risk. Risk group three is or RG3 is high risk group. And risk group four or RG4 is extremely high risk group. In risk group one, this is the lowest risk group organisms. Uh, these agents are not associated with any disease. Um, there are a list of agents that are not associated with the disease. These uh, agents include both bacterial agents, viral agents, as well as uh, uh, fungal agents. E. coli and uh, different strains of not pathogenic E. coli and yeast are examples for risk group 1. These agents represent uh, the lowest risk group. And if you go to the risk group 2, these agents are associated with a series which is a uh, disease which is uh, uh, rarely serious and um, for which uh, uh, therapeutic or preventive measures are also available. Uh, these agents uh, represent uh, um, uh, low risk to individual but uh, 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 due to limited spread of infections. There are several uh, uh, groups of bacterial and viral agents included in the group. Some of the bacterial agents include Clostridium species, Streptococcus species, and some of the viral agents, examples for some of the viral agents are measles virus and mumps virus. So these all are uh, 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 these uh, microorganisms come under uh, risk group two of uh, um, pathogenic organisms. Now, if we look at risk group three, these are 
micro organisms uh, that cause uh, serious disease and for which uh, uh, treatment or uh, preventive measures may be available and they represent um, uh, high risk to individual as well as to the uh, community. Um, and uh, some of the uh, major examples are mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, the causative agent of tuberculosis, and Yersinia pestis, which is the causative agent of uh, plague. HIV, which causes um, AIDS, is also included under this group 3 organisms, and SARS coronaviruses from culture are also included under uh, risk group 3 organisms. Rabies is also a risk group 3 organism. And then the last group is risk group 4. This uh, group, um, these are agents uh, that cause uh, serious or lethal disease. And for them, treatment or preventive measures may not be available. These agents can be transmitted from one individual to another. They cause uh, um, high risk to individual as, as well as to the community. Some of the examples are Casanova forest disease virus, Nipah virus, Ebola virus, Marburg virus. These are examples for uh, risk group for viruses. So, we saw that four groups of uh, uh, infectious microorganisms are there and these uh, four groups are classified based on the uh, disease severity. In group one, do not cause any human disease, but group two cause, can cause uh, human disease, which is not severe disease, but group three can cause severe human disease. Uh, and for which uh, effective uh, prophylaxis or treatment uh, may be available. And group four um, causes uh, severe human disease, but for this group, um, no effective uh, treatment or no effective prophylaxis is available. This is the basis of classification of organisms into different groups. Now I will move on to the biosafety levels. How this, so we saw that there are de uh, different groups of microorganisms. How these microorganisms can be safely handling, handled in biosafety laboratories. So, um, so biosafety laboratories are specially designed for safely handling uh, these infectious agents. There are mainly four biosafety levels. Biosafety level one handles low risk organisms. Biosafety level two is used for moderate risk organisms. And biosafety level three is used for high risk organisms. Biosafety level four is for high risk and highly dangerous agents such as Nipah, Ebola are handled in biosafety level four laboratories. And uh, so what are the uh, functions of these biosafety laboratories or why do we use biosafety laboratories? There are mainly three requirements. First one is uh, laboratory practices, safety equipment and facility constructions. When we follow these three requirements, we can safely handle the uh, um, uh, uh, dangerous as well as uh, low risk microorganisms in biosafety laboratories. Thereby we can protect ourselves or uh, protect the researcher from uh, getting infected with the organisms as well as uh, 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 we can prevent uh, release of these microorganisms to the environment. Uh, so these are the uh, purpose of using uh, biosafety laboratories for handling various types of microorganisms. So if you look at biosafety level one, as I said, these uh, organisms uh, cannot cause disease in humans. Uh, or certain biological materials with minimal hazard can also be handled in biosafety level 1 laboratories. Examples, as I said, include a different species of non-pathogenic E. coli and yeast are examples for biosafety level 1 um, organisms. Uh, so, and I also mentioned that there are three uh, important uh, factors that need to be considered when we work in biosafety laboratories. The first one is biosafety laboratory practices and the second one is safety equipment, the third one is facility construction. So why do we need to consider these three important practices? So in biosafety level one, uh, in, uh, usually we follow standard microbiological practices. So what are standard microbiological practices? Uh, 
I'll come to this part of the uh, talk uh, at the later part of my talk. And in these cases, work is performed on open benches. Uh, no special equipment is uh, used because these are uh, non-pathogenic organisms. Mostly non-pathogenic organisms are included in biosafety level one group. And the safety equipment, if you look at the safety equipment, uh, uh, wear laboratory coats, gowns, gloves, etc. for protecting yourself or uh, protecting the researcher. Eye uh, protection for um, uh, using safety glasses or goggles can be used for eye protection and for facility design a sink must be available for hand washing so these are the three requirements for a biosafety level one laboratories uh, a typical example for biosafety level one laboratory is uh, the laboratories that we use for graduate classes for teaching graduate classes uh, we use normally biosafety development laboratories there you can uh, see that we use open benches for our work and they also follow uh, standard microbiological practices such as wearing uh, coats gowns uh, gloves etc and a sink will be also available for hand washing so that is why these uh, um, kinds of laboratories are called biosafety level 1 laboratories. And if you look at biosafety level 2 laboratories, in addition to biosafety level 1 practices, uh, <clears throat> he said that in biosafety level 1 standard microbiological practices are followed. In addition to standard microbiological practices, some additional requirements are also required in biosafety level 2 practices. In biosafety level 2 mostly, uh, uh, group 2 risk organisms are um, uh, handled or biosafety level 2 is used for handling um, group 2 risk organisms. Group 2 risk organisms can cause disease, they can cause disease uh, uh, but uh, may not be serious diseases. Um, so the laboratory practices in biosafety level 2 includes a biosafety cabinet. A biosafety cabinet is required for handling infectious microorganisms. When you handle or uh, when you use uh, uh, infectious microorganisms within this biosafety cabinet, the infectious microorganisms cannot go uh, out of the laboratory, cannot, uh, 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 cannot go out of the laboratory. And uh, for using uh, biosafety level 2 laboratories, uh, training in handling infectious microorganisms is also required. And another thing is that access to these kinds of laboratories is highly restricted. Only authorized personnel are allowed to enter uh, biosafety level 2 laboratories, and authorized personnel are not allowed to enter uh, biosafety level 2 laboratories. So, these are the laboratory practices in biosafety level 2 laboratories. And another thing is that a biohazard warning sign must be posted at the entrance to the laboratory. This is a picture of a biohazard warning sign. This biohazard warning sign is represented by uh, four circles and these four circles is a chain of uh, infection that indicates agent, host, source and transmission. So this warning sign must be also posted at the entrance of the biosafety level 2 laboratories. Uh, that is uh, mainly to prevent uh, unauthorized entry of uh, people to uh, biosafety level 2 laboratories. And another thing is that safety equipment, uh, what should be done in biosafety, uh, biological safety cabinets or BSC, an autoclave uh, also should be available for decontamination. And the other thing is that facility constructions, what are the things that need to be bear in mind when we uh, design facilities for uh, biosafety level 2 laboratories. And one is lockable self-closing door, another one is a sink for washing hands, another one is eye wash facility also should be available in biosafety level 2 laboratories. So why do we need to take so much protection or so much, uh, uh, why need to, uh, why do, uh, we consider so much factors for uh, 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 biosafety level 2 laboratories because in biosafety laboratories we mainly handle uh, organisms that cause diseases. In biosafety level 3 laboratories, I said that in biosafety labor 3 laboratories, um, highly infectious organisms are handled. Uh, 
uh, infectious organisms such as uh, HIV, uh, SARS coronavirus, etc., are handled uh, using biosafety level 3 laboratories. So, in laboratory practices in Russia, uh, persons who have been uh, immunized are uh, allowed to uh, enter uh, uh, biosafety level 3 laboratories and entry is more restricted than biosafety level 2 laboratories. And if you look at safety equipment, so what are the safety equipment used in biosafety level 3 laboratories? Uh, one is that uh, just like uh, biosafety level 2 laboratories, the uh, research or all work uh, that involves uh, microorganisms are conducted inside uh, biosafety cabinet. Similarly, a respiratory protector is also required uh, to prevent uh, the transmission of organisms through a respiratory route. Respiratory protection is also required. So, these are some of the requirements of biosafety level, uh, level 3 laboratories. In addition to these, if we uh, consider the facility construction, self-closing doors, exhaust air cannot be recirculated. That means 100% recirculation, uh, biosafety cabinet with 100% recirculation should be used. And the uh, last thing is that negative pressure, maintain negative pressure in laboratories at all times. Uh, why do we need to maintain negative pressure in laboratories? When we maintain uh, negative pressure in laboratories, no virus or no bacteria or no uh, microorganisms that can cause serious disease will escape from the laboratory because the, the surrounding environment is uh, uh, positive pressure. So uh, from the negative pressure, the microorganisms cannot live and cannot escape from the laboratory. So these microorganisms are contained within the laboratory and the microorganisms contained within the laboratory is um, uh, destroyed by uh, certain devices such as uh, HEPA filters and these HEPA filters without um, all the microorganisms present in the laboratory. So, the, so that way we can contain the organisms within the laboratory without escaping from the laboratory uh, to the environment. And now the last level is the biosafety level 4 laboratories. This is the maximum containment laboratory and this is, gives maximum protection and uh, highly dangerous microorganisms such as Nipah virus, Ebola virus, uh, Marburg virus, etc. are handled in biosafety level 4 laboratories. And in addition to biosafety level 3 laboratories, these three in laboratories uh, practices are a little different uh, because entry through the there is uh, entry through the clothing change room uh, and exit through shower rooms. So before entering to uh, biosafety level four, uh, uh, people who are working in biosafety level uh, must wear the laboratory uh, uh, laboratory clothes and before exiting uh, they should also take a shower before exiting and, and used laboratory clothing must be decontaminated before exiting so these are some of the uh, laboratory practices in biosafety level uh, biosafety level for laboratories and uh, if you consider the safety equipment uh, we should use class 3 biological safety cabinet or um, in the suit laboratory, and, uh, which is a very full body air supplied positive pressure air suit. And for facility construction, we said for in a separate building, BSL4 facilities must be built in a separate building or an isolated and restricted zone of the building. And it should have uh, dedicated supply and exhaust air, vacuum lines, and decontamination systems. So, so these are some of the factors that need, we need to consider when we construct a BSL-4 facility for handling highly infectious microorganisms or highly infectious viruses such as Nipah and Ebola viruses. Now, uh, so, so we were talking about a different uh, biosafety levels. And so these biosafety laboratories provide three types of protection. One is personal protection. So if you look at this picture, the personal protection is achieved by wearing a headgear and also by wearing a respirator and also by wearing um, a lab coat, um, gloves, etc. of the personal protection. And product protection, the product, or if you are culturing a cell or if you are culturing some other things, 
the product is uh, handled inside the laboratory so inside the laboratory it is a sterile environment so no contamination will take place when you handle the products inside the laboratory so that is why it is called product protection so personal protection is achieved product protection is achieved and for the third thing is environment protection environment protection means no uh, microorganisms uh, no microorganisms co that cause uh, um, disease can enter inside the uh, 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 biosafety level hood or no microorganisms can escape from the biosafety level hood because the microorganisms that are trapped inside the hood is filtered out using uh, HEPA filters and uh, there are some other, uh, some other factors that prevent the entry of microorganisms from the outside environment to the uh, inner part of the uh, part of the uh, uh, biosafety uh, cabinet. So this is how we uh, achieve the personal protection, product protection and, and environment protection. So this is a picturized picture showing um, uh, various kinds of biosafety level, uh, laboratories as I uh, I've said in the previous slide, by in biosafety level one, uh, uh, it's uh, mostly performed on open benches. Uh, when we perform this on open benches, product protection is not achieved. At the same time, personal protection is achieved by wearing personal uh, protective equipment such as um, uh, blouse, uh, <coughs> blouse and uh, um, uh, laboratory coats. In BSL-2 laboratories, the personal protection is uh, achieved by using face shield or um, um, uh, safety glasses or goggles and by uh, wearing a lab coat. And in BSL-2 laboratories, a biosafety cabinet is also required and the biosafety cabinet is required for protecting your product from uh, contamination. In biosafety level 3 laboratories, it is much more stringent than biosafety level 2 laboratories because personal protective equipment uh, such as respirator is also required in biosafety level 3 laboratories. In addition to that, as I said, negative pressure is required. When there is negative pressure inside the lab, the uh, viral particles or the bacterial particles which are harmful to others cannot escape from the laboratory and they will be contained within the laboratory and they will be also destroyed within the laboratory by some other mechanisms and biosafety level for laboratories um, this uh, specific uh, suit must uh, must be worn uh, when you work in biosafety for laboratories these are in addition to biosafety level 3 laboratories here also uh, negative pressure is maintained for um, uh, for containing the microbes within the laboratory <coughs> so uh, I said that in biosafety laboratories, uh, especially in biosafety level one laboratories, uh, standard practices are followed. Uh, mostly in uh, almost all of the laboratories, common standard practices are common to all laboratories. But um, <clears throat> in biosafety level two, level three, and level four, some special practices are also followed. So, what are the standard practices that are followed in uh, biosafety level laboratories? So if you look at this picture, you can see these are the standard practices that need to be followed in biosafety level laboratories. First one is wearing uh, goggles or safety glasses uh, to protect uh, eyes from uh, um, infectious uh, uh, splashes or uh, hazardous chemicals and to protect eye from uh, infectious materials or um, hazardous chemicals. Second one is wearing lab coat or with the long sleeves and third is wear gloves wear long pants and wear closed two shoes. So these are some of the standard practices that has to be um, followed in uh, standard uh, microbiological laboratories or BSL-1 laboratories. Uh, in addition to that, there are certain uh, more uh, things to be considered when you uh, uh, work in BSL-1 laboratories. This um, first one is uh, no mouth pipetting is allowed because mouth pipetting is one of the reasons for um, uh, reasons for ingestion of microorganisms uh, through mouth. And <clears throat> use mechanical pipettes for uh, pipetting. 
similarly eating drinking smoking etc are not allowed in uh, biosafety laboratories uh, storing food is also not allowed in biosafety laboratories food can be stored in um, uh, designated areas outside uh, the laboratories and uh, the next thing is that to minimize or avoid the creation of splashes or errors also um, aerosol creation uh, should be avoided in uh, biosafety laboratories. The other thing is that when we use shafts, syringes or uh, uh, other shafts, that must be avoided or if we use, uh, we need to discard them uh, properly to uh, uh, sharp containers and these uh, sharp containers are meant, are meant for um, uh, for uh, taking care of the uh, shafts, contaminated uh, shafts. Uh, the other thing is that uh, after once you are done with work, decontaminate work area and equipment with the disinfectant. Mostly, uh, seventy percentage ethanol is used for decontamination, and this seventy percentage ethanol can decontaminate uh, almost all kinds of microorganisms, including. Uh, infectious uh, viruses and bacteria and uh, when you use cultures or st stocks or other potentially infectious materials they also need to be decontaminated before dis disposal uh, for decontamination of these uh, uh, cultures and stocks we can use either use uh, 10 percentage bleach and after uh, treating with the 10 percentage bleach autoclave them and then uh, dispose of the uh, uh, decontaminated material. Then after uh, finishing work, wash hands thoroughly before leaving the laboratory. Then some of the special practices, the special practices are required mainly for uh, uh, BSL-2, uh, BSL-3 and BSL-4 laboratories. The special practices include worker safety, environmental protection and uh, to deal with the risk of handling infectious agents. So these special practices require increasing levels of containment. So I'm just summarizing the, uh, whatever um, I have talked now. <coughs> the first one is BSL-1 laboratory. In BSL-1 laboratory, um, uh, organisms that do not cause uh, uh, diseases um, are handled. And in these kinds of laboratories, standard microbiological practices are followed. And here no primary barriers are required. At the same time, uh, personal protective equipments are required in biosafety level 1 laboratory. So, uh, laboratory bench and the sink are also required for um, biosafety level 1 laboratories. In biosafety level 2 laboratories, uh, normally uh, um, microorganisms that cause diseases are handled in biosafety level 2 laboratories. In addition to biosafety level uh, one practices, um, access is uh, controlled um, and the biohazard warning signs must be posted and charge precautions must be taken and biosafety manual also should be prepared for biosafety level two laboratories. And here the primary barriers include biosafety cabinets as well as uh, uh, personal protective equipment. And here also, in addition to biosafety level one practices, and that is either you can use a laboratory bench or sink uh, for washing. In addition to this, an autoclave is also required for uh, decontaminating the um, uh, infectious agents that you use in um, BSL2 laboratories. Um, if we come to the third one, that is uh, the biosafety level three laboratories. In biosafety level three laboratories, we normally um, uh, handle um, infectious uh, uh, microorganisms uh, which cause uh, serious diseases. So in addition to biosafety level 2 practices, we should also, uh, the, uh, uh, we should also uh, control access and uh, decontamination of all waste is also required. Uh, decontamination of all waste means uh, solid waste and liquid waste decontamination is required. Decontamination of laboratory clothing before laundering is also required in biosafety level 3 laboratories. So, and uh, considering the barriers and safety equipment, a biosafety cabinet is required. Similarly, uh, personal protective equipment is also required. Biosafety level 2 <coughs> uh, uh, the facilities include physical separation from access uh, corridors and self-closing double door access, 
and exhausted air not recirculated, negative pressure and entry through airlock or anti room and hand washing facilities also should be provided in biosafety level 3 laboratories. And when we come to biosafety level 3 laboratories, I'm so, I'm sorry, biosafety level 4 laboratories, uh, biosafety 4 laboratories are used for handling highly infectious uh, 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 microorganisms. Highly infectious viruses are also handled in uh, biosafety level 4 um, laboratories. In these laboratories, in addition to biosafety level 3 practices, uh, there should be a clothing change room and a shower room, and all materials should be contaminated on exit from facility. And primary barriers include all procedures conducted in class 3 biosafety cabinet. Uh, class 1 or 2 biosafety cabinet in combination with the full body air supplied positive pressure rule. Um, so for facilities also we need to consider in additional requirements some, uh, such as separated building or isolated zone, dedicated supply and exhaust vacuum and decontamination system other requirements outlined in the um, and other requirements are also required. <coughs> So, so far we have been talking about uh, 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 microorganisms that cause diseases and how these microorganisms can be safely handled in different types of biosafety laboratories. That is what we have been talking about. Now, we, uh, 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 I will also discuss uh, how to write standard operating procedure for a microbiology uh, laboratory or a biosafety laboratory. So when we write a standard operating procedure for a microbiology laboratory or a uh, biosafety laboratory, the first thing is that we need to mention the laboratory's name of the laboratory or the department. If it is a BSL-1 biology laboratory, write BSL-1 laboratory and if it is BSL-2 uh, biology laboratory, write BSL-2 laboratory. And where is the uh, laboratory located? The laboratory is located in ground floor or first floor level and room number can also be mentioned. So this uh, information should be there. And then the principal investigator in most of the colleges, a faculty in charge should be there uh, to take care of the uh, laboratory. So either the faculty in charge or the uh, principal investigator's name can be given here and his designation, his or her designation and the department's name, phone number also should be provided. And then uh, regarding the laboratory staff who are working in the, uh, uh, who are taking care of the uh, laboratory, the name of the laboratory staff and designation of the laboratory staff. Designation of the laboratory staff means if uh, there is a lab supervisor, give his name and lab supervisor. If it, uh, there is a lab laboratory man manager, uh, give his name and the uh, designation. Then uh, emergency contact uh, number and the name also should be given uh, in the general information about the laboratory. In addition to that, we should also provide a qualification of the principal investigator or faculty in charge. Here you can give 10 years of experience in biology laboratory or 12 years of experience in microbiology laboratory. The experience should be given. Then the laboratory staff's experience also should be, his qualifications and experience also should be given. So this is the first thing that we need to give in the uh, uh, um, standard operating procedure. Uh, when we prepare a standard operating procedure for biosafety laboratory. Um, and so the next thing is the agents or the um, uh, infectious organisms that are handled in biosafety level 1 and biosafety level 2 laboratories. If you are handling biosafety level 1 agents, uh, give the name of the agents. If, you, if it is uh, a E. coli, a non-pathogenic strain, CDHF5 alpha, or if it is infect, insect cells, SF9, Na give the name of the agents here and if you are handling BSL-2 agents, give the name of the agents. If it is viral agents, write, write viral agents and then the name of the viral agent. If it is, uh, I have written here Epstein-Barr virus, so Epstein-Barr virus and then give a small details uh, uh, about the virus. Yeah, Epstein-Barr virus is an oncogenic virus and it causes 
various kinds of lymphomas and the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So those these stages also should be given here uh, when you write the SOP. And if you are writing, um, if you are using other viruses, other viruses name also can be given. Dengue virus, uh, give the name of the uh, uh, virus and also the details of the virus. Details of the virus means this virus causes a dengue fever and uh, some other uh, health issues associated with the virus infection. So, so those details are shown should be given. And if you are using dengue virus, give the um, dengue virus details here. And if you are using bacterial agents, give the name of the bacteria and the details about the de uh, bacteria. Details about the bacteria means if it is a gram negative or gram positive bacteria and what disease uh, the bacteria causes. So that also should be given. And then fungal agents, uh, give the name of the fungus and the uh, disease caused by the fungal agents also should be given. So I'm mainly talking about BSL-1 and BSL-2 agents. I'm not going to talk about BSL-3 agents and BSL-4 agents because BSL-3 and BSL-4 agents are not normally not used in uh, colleges and other in most of the places because uh, that require um, highly stringent procedures and a lot of uh, um, other things. So now, uh, once you uh, provide the details of the agents, uh, biosafety level agents, then the next thing is that how you are going to handle this uh, uh, infectious microorganisms in your laboratory. Uh, so, or what are the facilities and laboratory equipment available uh, uh, in your laboratory for handling this microorganisms? So, so give a list of the facilities available in, in, in your laboratory. See? Then you can write that there are workbench areas, there are refrigerators, there are freezers, um, uh, centrifuges, water bath, a sink for washing hands, carbon dioxide incubator, liquid nitrogen tank. So all these are available in your laboratory. And write the purpose of each of these. Uh, and refrigerators are used for storing um, bacterial stocks or refrigerators are used for storing uh, short-term storage of viruses. Or freezers are used for, for uh, long-term storage of um, uh, proteins, uh, freezers are used for long-term storage of other reagents and centrifuges are used for centrifuging, um, uh, uh, centrifuging the uh, uh, research material and what and so similarly uh, write the use of each of these equipments uh, so this is the uh, next part of the uh, SOP and then um, if you are using any special equipment such as biosafety cabinet or autoclave, um, write uh, uh, here that is, uh, biosafety cabinet will be used for uh, handling all uh, uh, infectious organisms. If you are using virus, you can say, uh, say that all uh, viruses uh, that are infectious will be handled in biosafety cabinet and this biosafety cabinet is located in a separate room. And uh, if you are using autoclave, you can say that autoclave will be used for decontaminating the um, materials that are uh, used for um, research purposes. Or autoclave will also be used for um, uh, sterilizing the materials required for uh, research purposes. This can also be given. So this is mainly to show that you are using all the facilities required for handling infectious or non-infectious microorganisms. Uh, microorganisms. So this uh, detailed um, uh, write-up should be given here when you write the SOP. Now the next thing is that the safety procedures for handling infectious agents or non-infectious agents. So how do you handle the non-infectious or infectious agents in your um, uh, laboratory? The first thing is that upon laboratory, uh, wear lab coat, gloves, sleeves and mask for work with the infectious agents. So write this and then you write that handle infectious agents uh, within class 2 biosafety laboratories. If you are using infectious microorganisms and this should be there because you have to make sure that you are using um, or you have to show that you are using a biosafety level 2 cabinet for handling infectious microorganisms so, but in the case of biosafety level 1 the work can be performed on open uh, lab bench uh, and you don't have to use a biosafety level 2 cabinet but you can use um, uh, other uh, types of cabinet for uh, uh, cabinet uh, uh, in biosafety development laboratories 
and uh, for sterilization of surfaces uh, so uh, you can use 70 uh, percentage ethanol 70 percentage ethanol can remove most of the microorganisms including bacteria and viruses the 70 percentage ethanol uh, actually destabilize the outer coat of the bacteria or the uh, viral particles so they can remove the lipid from the outer coat and thereby inactivate the viral particles and vir uh, inactivate viral particles uh, um, as well as uh, uh, bacteria. And for disinfecting spills or large levels of contamination, uh, normally we use um, a 10 percentage bleach. 10 percentage bleach can also um, destabilize the outer coat. Also, it can denature the proteins of the a uh, microorganisms so, uh, 10 percentage bleach uh, denature the outer uh, um, uh, outer layer uh, or it can destroy the outer layer or denature the proteins present in the outer layer of virus or outer layer of uh, bacteria or, or other organisms so 10 percentage bleach is also uh, used in uh, used for disinfecting spills or large levels of contamination next is use disposable plastic pipettes for pipettings um, and don't use uh, reusable plastic pipettes and uh, reusable uh, pipettes and use uh, uh, disposable plastic pipettes for uh, pipetting and discard these uh, pipettes and other materials within a biohazard autoclave bag. If you are using infectious organism, after um, uh, discarding this in biohazard autoclave bag, autoclave them and then uh, dispose the uh, autoclaved material. And the next thing is that liquids uh, uh, from cultures are disposed into bleach and uh, allow this to stand for uh, 30 minutes to kill all the organisms present in the, uh, present in the culture. And then after that, autoclave the uh, liquid and dispose of uh, the autoclaved liquid in um, uh, and then you can dispose of the autoclave and liquid. The ne next thing is contaminated solid waste disposal. So, contaminated solid waste disposal means uh, culture dishes, plates, tubes, etc., are included in contaminated solid uh, waste. Uh, so these are actually disposed of in biohazard bag and the biohazard bags are autoclaved and the autoclaved biohazard bags are then disposed. Um, uh, then next one is uh, contaminated liquid waste disposal. Uh, liquid waste disposal means uh, liquid waste includes uh, contaminated cell cultures and treat these contaminated cell cultures with a 10 percentage bleach for uh, 24 hours and 30 minutes to 24 hours can be used and that is uh, depending on the type of organisms that you use. And then autoclave the uh, treated liquid and dispose of in, uh, dispose of in laboratory sink. Uh, dispose of an app uh, in the power placing. Uh, then the next thing is uh, disposal of shafts and broken uh, glassware disposal. Uh, shafts must be placed in a sharp disposal container and dispose broken glassware in broken uh, glass disposal boxes. And so they should have separate uh, sharp containers and separate broken glass disposal boxes for disposing uh, glasses and uh, shafts. Finally, when you do the uh, centrifugation, um, cent for centrifugation, place the samples in sealed tubes and the outer side of the uh, outer part of the centrifuge tubes uh, must be cleaned with 70 percentage alcohol and then place them in a sealed rotor and centrifuge to prevent any aerosol leakage. And after centrifugation, all materials are transported in, into the biosafety hood because if you are using infectious material, they, after centrifugation, they, you are not allowed to open uh, them outside the biosafety hood. They are um, required uh, to take the, um, uh, the, the uh, centrifuge material to the biosafety hood and open them inside the biosafety hood. And then uh, next is decontamination of work surfaces and this is uh, 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 this has to be done 
daily after finishing work and following spills. Contaminated surfaces can be wiped with 70% alcohol or with 10% bleach solution and place in biohazard garbage bags and auto plate. And um, the next one is storage of samples. Once you are done with your uh, work, you have to store your samples. And if you are using the samples for short term storage, you can place the uh, samples in uh, refrigerators and also you need to label them biosafety. Uh, put a biosafety label on top of the uh, tubes uh, which you are use, which you are using for storing the uh, samples. For long term storage, uh, the tubes uh, with samples will be stored in minus 80 freezer. Long term storage proteins or RNA or DNA are normally stored for long term storage in minus 80 degree uh, freezer. And after finishing work, remove uh, personal protective items, uh, lab coat, gloves, sleeves and mask and then wash hands with the soap and water at the sink. And then the next thing is uh, uh, the things which are not to do in the workplace. Uh, eating, drinking, smoking or applying smoke, uh, cosmetics etc. are not allowed in uh, laboratories. Uh, storing food in laboratory is also not allowed. Food must be stored outside the lab uh, laboratory in designated areas. Similarly, mouth pipetting is also not allowed in uh, biosafety level laboratories. And then finally, uh, if you are uh, using uh, infectious microorganisms, the training should be given to the um, new or uh, newly joined uh, staff uh, before they start their work. Um, training can be given by the PI or a senior research uh, personnel in the lab. They have to be trained in various laboratory procedures. Uh, these laboratory procedures include entry uh, to exit, that is how do they enter the lab what are the other procedures uh, that they need to complete when they uh, work in biosafety level laboratories and the next thing is uh, decontamination that is how do they decontaminate uh, the work surfaces how do they um, uh, um, decontaminate solid waste and how do they decontaminate uh, liquid waste and how how do they uh, dispose the solid and liquid waste? Training should be given on all these aspects. Similarly, biological and chemical skill occurs. If an accident occurs, how do they manage biological and chemical skill? Uh, skill? And uh, you have to also keep a record of uh, training that has given to the uh, newly joined staff. And uh, some of the concerns that I have not addressed in this talk are animal biosafety and uh, recombinant DNA biosafety, radioisotope biosafety, and safety in chemistry lab, safety in physics lab, etc. are also not included. However, I have included a couple of slides uh, which can be used for chemistry uh, laboratory people and uh, physics laboratory uh, scientists. So in chemistry laboratories, in biological laboratories, we saw that the biological hazards are viruses, bacteria or fungal agents. Whereas in chemistry laboratories, the hazards are uh, some nephrotic agents, neurotoxic agents, or carcinogens, or terrestrogens. So, so nephrotic agents damage kidneys, neurotoxic agents damage uh, nervous system, carcinogens induce uh, uh, cancer formation, teratogens are uh, teratogens induce um, uh, birth defects. So we need to identify the type of hazard or uh, hazardous um, material that we are using. Uh, uh, for our research and once we identify the hazard we also need to uh, prepare a protocol for handling these hazards uh, in the laboratory um, so mostly for if you are using these kinds of agents a specialized equipment is required which is called fume hood for biological laboratories we use biosafety hood uh, but here it is called a fume hood. So this fume hood will protect uh, you from hazards and it will also remove chemical aerosols and fumes and from the work area and when working with the toxins. And this means that these uh, agents when you use them uh, you have to take these agents to the fume hoods, open them in the fume hoods. Uh, when you open them in the fume hoods uh, you will be protected from any hazard that is caused by these agents and um, the aerosols and fumes that are released in the fume hoods uh, will be um, 
uh, will go out to uh, the field. So in physics laboratory, the hazards are uh, radiation, laser, UV light, magnetic field, sound, etc. The hazards in, in physics laboratories. So in this case, the safety procedure is different. For if you are using any radioactive material, you need to wear personal protective equipment. Say, for example, if you are using a gamma uh, radioactive material, you have to wear that lead coat to pro uh, prevent you from uh, 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 you from uh, uh, getting the uh, penetrating the gamma radiation. Uh, similarly, for lasers, avoid direct exposure to beam and wear personal protective equipment and eye protection such as goggles and glasses can be used. And for UV light also, avoid direct exposure to UV. And magnetic field, wear appropriate uh, uh, personal protective equipment when you uh, use um, uh, magnetic field that cause injury to, um, injury to, to the uh, person. And then uh, sound um, uh, provide hearing protection such as uh, ear plug or ear um, muff can be provided for. Um, uh, that's all about uh, uh, my talk and uh, thank you for listening and I hope you understood something and if you have any questions uh, please Thank you, sir. Thank you for the very informative session. You have very vividly explained uh, the biosafety levels, the decontamination methods, as well as the standard operating procedures we follow at the science departments. Uh, really, it was a very wonderful session, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, can I have one down? Uh, yes. Uh, sir, in our college level, uh, whether we have to follow all these levels, uh, so that is depending on the type of organisms on which your research is being conducted. So uh, if you are not working on infectious microorganisms, then you can follow biosafety level 1. Biosafety level 1 is uh, um, you have to op use open benches, uh, a sink should be there for washing hands and then the uh, next thing is that uh, wear protective equipments. Uh, students should be provided laboratory coat uh, uh, and gloves when they are working with the uh, non-infectious uh, microorganisms. Other so than that, no, you don't need to... Okay, sorry sir. Uh, what type of treatment may we have to undergo for the lab coats in the case of students? Any special procedures to be carried out? Uh, treatment means what kind of uh, uh, how um, usual cleaning is needed or any disinfectants or like that? We uh, have no, to... no, no, usual cleaning is enough. No okay. disinfectant, you don't have to use any disinfectant. Okay, so in our home science case, we are having the uh, food science lab as well as the biochemistry lab. Okay, so uh, for product development, what uh, sometimes we have to dry the food items. Uh, and uh, what uh, the what's happening is that uh, we will be keeping it in the refrigerator because uh, it might take some days. Uh, uh, so what uh, what is the actual procedure we have to go through it actually? Uh, actually is there any problem uh, with that microbial contamination? Uh, so that's what I said. Is uh, yeah, food items if we are storing this for short, uh, if it is for short term storage, then you can keep them at uh, four degrees centigrade refrigerators. But if you want to store them for long term, then you should use uh, either minus twenty degrees centigrade freezers or minus eighty degrees centigrade freezers. Otherwise, uh, in 4 degrees centigrade also certain bacterial and fungal growth will be there that can contaminate your product. So uh, to avoid that and, uh, and if you intend to uh, store it for long term, then better you can use um, uh, minus 20 degree or minus eight, uh, 80 degree freezers. Okay. So uh, one more. Uh question uh, regarding the standard operating procedure is there any guidelines uh, that are specifically given uh, which have to be followed by colleges uh, so actually uh, you can go to the dbt website dbt website has given uh, some guidelines 
I don't think it is specifically for uh, uh, colleges, for research laboratories, they have given some guidelines, biosafety guidelines. There you can see the guidelines for uh, uh, biosafety levels. Okay. We are able to set our own guidelines uh, based on this. Uh, so whatever I have talked today, I have referred the word WHO guidelines as well as DBT guidelines and NIH guidelines. I have included all uh, the points, most of the points from their uh, guidelines. So if you, like what I said, I um, sh uh, showed you a template for preparing standard operating procedures. So that is the template for uh, preparing standard operating procedures. So you can prepare a manual or template, uh, a standard operating procedure for your laboratory and that standard operating procedure should be provided to all uh, students who are working in the in the laboratory. They should uh, read and understand the standard operating procedure before they start their work in the lab. Thank you sir. It was actually very much informative, especially the standard operating procedures. Uh, students, any more doubts or anyone Dr. have Bhagia? any doubts? Yes Dr. sir. Bhagia? Yes sir. May I say something? Yes sir, sure. Sure, sure sir. Sure sir. Uh, Dr. Bohan, First yes. of all, let me thank you for a very excellent uh, talk on this biosafety. Thank you, sir. I am Dr. Abdul Rashid, yeah. president you, of AFSK Kolam chapter, and uh, I work in your neighborhood at Charangir. I am principal of Muskar Engineering College. Oh, okay. Good to hear that. And uh, also, I would like to congratulate Bhagya for organizing such a wonderful, uh, useful topic in the webinar. And another person I know actually Dr. Anju Niliara, but I have not met him. I think she is also there. So I would like to thank both of them for uh, involving AFSK column chapter into this uh, program. Thank you very much. And congratulations to St. John's College for Women for organizing such a wonderful uh, program. Thank you. Okay, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for giving us the collaboration with AFSTA. Any more doubts? Okay, I think uh, there are no questions. Uh, so now uh, we shall move on to the formal vote of thanks. Now let me invite Dr. Pinky Cherian, Assistant Professor of Department of Botany for the vote of thanks. Thank you, Bhagyanas. A warm good evening to one and all. I'm here to express my gratitude in behalf of St. Joseph College for Women, Alapura, and Research Committee. Inside, the Science Day program was organized by Research Committee and IQAC, St. Joseph College for Women, in collaboration with SBTI, AFSTI, Skill India, and Institutional Innovation Council, aimed to transform young minds through science covering innovative programs. Webinar on biosafety created an awareness on the role of microbes in daily living. Spread of COVID-19 has created a great pandemic in the world. Though research labs are there with a lot of facilities provoking this spreading of virus. The talk demanded a concern for the emergence of microbes from lab and also the safety protocols that has to be conducted in order to overcome this. Biosafety protection is to protect laboratory workers, clinical specimens, and the environment surrounding. The sir has mentioned about the standard microbiology practices and filing of SOP in a very clear manner. With these words, let me move on to the duty of rendering vote of thanks. Gratitude is a word of silence that expresses wholehearted thanks. Respected Principal Dr. Rita Leather Dikoto. Esteemed Speaker, Dr. Mohan Viliera, Vidya Vitil, President SBTI, Dr. Edithil Vijayan, Secretary SBTI, Dr. Anju Tiyar, President AFSTI, Dr. K.K. Abdul Rashid, Secretary AFSTI, Dr. Tara CM, IQAC Coordinator, Dr. Anju M. Neliera, Executive Members of SBTI, AFSTI Column Chapter, Skill India, Institution Innovation Council, Research Executive Members, 
teachers, lab assistants and my dear students. First of all, I would like to thank our respected principal, Dr. Rita Leda Dikoto, for being our light and provide facility to conduct the event. With utmost respect, on the behalf of Research Committee IPAC, SPCI, AFSTI, Skill India, Institution Innovation Council, I express my gratitude to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Mohanan Viliavitil. Senior Principal Scientist of Institute of Advanced Virology among our mates. Thank you, sir, for being with us, for giving a wonderful talk on biosafety measures. Thank you. Thank you. I, ho I wholeheartedly express my gratitude to all dignitaries of our collaborators, Institution Innovation Council, President, Secretary, SBTI, Dr. K.K. Rashid, Dr. Tara CM, and thank you all for your valuable support. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. M, uh, Anju M. Nayara, our IPAC coordinator, who is a constant source of motivation and support and encouragement. I thank you, ma'am, for being with us. We have been fortunate enough to back with a, by a team of proactive and dedicated staff of our Josephine family. I thank all heads of the department, faculty members, research committee members, lab attenders to make this event fruitful. Last but not the least, I thank our dearest students for attending this section. Thank you. Thank you all.